So you're actually going to video it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, so this is uh, actually in the basement of my house, which is next to the garage where my shop is. And I sort of creeped in here after a few years. And I just This is where I store my lumber. So I've got a lumber rack where I keep uh, all the long boards, the big stuff. And I also have a shelf uh, back here on the other wall where I keep shorts and I keep bending forms and things like that. Uh, it still needs to be straightened up a little bit. I just clean. I just made the lumber rack, so it's not quite as clean as it normally would be. Uh, but uh, so that's all. It's back in here, and then through the old foundation wall. You don't realize how much you use it until it's not in the shop anymore. Uh, is my the main area of my shop, and you can see uh, I've got a pretty standard shop, like most people would. So I just, I've only got a six inch joiner, which I found off of a, a website, you know, old working machinery. And uh, I've got an old unisaw, which I found uh, through a friend of a friend of a friend back in Columbia, South Carolina, and it's an old bandsaw. Uh, actually, all of those machines, I'm kind of proud, all of those cost less than $300 each. Wow. Uh, so I did pretty good there. Uh, my planer did not cost less than three hundred dollars. <laughs> I wish it had, but it didn't. Uh, but I had to buy a new one. And I'm, I, the most recent thing I got was a dust collector, uh, and before that was my drill press, um, which I both of those were bought new. And I also have a, a radio alarm saw over there behind that door jam, uh, which I got. I traded a, an old number seven for. Uh, so that's how I got that. But, um, now, talk to me about these in-feed and out-feed tables. On the planer? Yeah. Sure. Um, everyone's shop is a little dirty. I think yeah, this is just, fairly clean. I, you know, when I bought this, I did not buy the, the manufactured in-feed, out-feed tables, but uh, I found that it was really not long enough to get rid of snipe, so I knew I had to do something. This is actually the second iteration of this cabinet. The first one was longer, and the, these in-feed, out-feed tables were longer, but I didn't really make it right, uh, and so it started to sag. And uh, so what I did was went back, and the key to really keeping it flat and straight is, it's sort of like a, quasi torsion box down here. It's the same setup as on my router table, which we did a video workshop on, and also on my sharpening station, which was in the magazine. So that keeps it really flat and rigid. And so then up here, it's just a piece of MDF. And this is just a uh, uh, you know construction lumber frame. And then there's also two pieces running across r directly underneath the, uh, the planer to, to support the weight and so the top doesn't start to sag. Okay. Uh, and then these are just, uh, I had some melamine and just, I edge, these little edges come up about an eighth of an inch so that wood uh, stays on track when it's going through. And uh, these cross members here, uh, there's a threaded insert in the plywood and then there's like, so there's a lock washer down there, and I can raise and lower it so that I could get it level, perfectly level, and uh, then lock it in place. So now these, the in-feed and the out-feed table are there, they're never going to move. And that actually helps quite a bit um, to minimize sniping, okay. uh, or snipe rather. And it just happens to work out perfectly that <laughs> that goes right under <laughs> my joiner. <laughs> yeah, it just happened to work out. There. If there's a problem, all you had to do is just you just pl put the uh, put that two by four through the planer. And you right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my it is up on two by fours because uh, last year we had all that snow and uh, when it started to thaw, I actually had like a geyser in my basement oh. and there was so much water coming out. Uh, through the garage doors that I, I put all my stuff up uh, to keep it dry. But, uh, and that's not, you know, there'll be doors on there eventually uh, for storage. And, um, and it's on wheels so that I can roll it around and get it out of the way if I need to. Um, 
And what do you have back here? So back here is where I spend most of my time in my shop. I've got my workbench and my tool cabinet. My tool cabinet is probably my pride and joy. It's really absurdly too nice uh, to be a tool cabinet. But this is one of the first things I ever made uh, and when I started to make furniture seriously. And uh, I made it in the shop of a guy down in Camden, South Carolina who took me in and taught me to make furniture. And this is pretty much where I keep all the tools I use on a regular basis. You know, up here is all my hand tools and things like uh, you know, mallets and chisels and all my layout tools go in, there, in these drawers and all my hand planes, uh, stuff like that. My hand saws are at a ready. And just down here is where I store like power tool uh, cartons, you know, power tool uh, low molded cases. Mm -hmm. And then I got my bench, uh, which is a fairly simple affair. There's just one vise. Uh, and all the other work I do, I either use, uh, you know, hold fast to keep things down or stops of some sort or another. One thing I really like about my bench is that it's plenty, it's really long, or at least for me it's long, it's seven feet. Which means that whenever I'm working on a piece, I can have the piece at the bench. And then as I'm making the drawer, fitting the drawer, it's just a short turn to get to it. So it never slows me down and I have to walk somewhere else in my shop. So I like always having that work piece there. Um, and I also keep my, there's you know, clamps back here. I sort of like the Irwin quick clamps, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I just go crazy on buying them because, you know, they're... You never have uh, enough. Yeah, you can never have enough, but the the parallel jaw clamps is really the, the best, one of the best things I ever bought because they're so fantastic to have in your shop. I mean, they're, they're perfect for, for furniture making. So, um, I don't know, and then I have, uh, just a little bit further out, I have my, uh, where I do all my sharpening. And there's also just a lot of storage in here, but uh, it's got a laminate countertop uh, up on top uh, It's water resistant, and it's next to a sink. So I always have a water source there, and I can sharpen, uh, and I sharpen a lot more now that I have this set up all the time, whereas it used to be go up in the house, go by the kitchen sink, and it was just a pain in the neck, but now I do it all the time. and so. I grind uh, primary bevels on sandpaper on that piece of granite there, and then I hone my secondary bevels on water stones. And uh, so, and this is important too. You gotta have the yes, you do. You have to have the music player. <laughs> <laughs> so, anything else you wanna just go around the rest of it? Yeah. Okay. Let's get it all. So this is. Drill press, uh, which I'm very happy I, I have. It's nice to have a big drill press, and I keep veneer up here. I actually, have, there's actually for me quite a bit of veneer up there right now, and just a little cabinet I made. Uh, now it pretty much just keeps uh, drill press stuff in there. Um, oh, there is an old router base, and my router table. It's not very old. I had one previously, but I recently made this one. Um, and it's got, uh, you know, it's got all the storage I need for my router bits and things like that. Um, and then uh, my uh, Unisaw, which is, uh, it's about a 1970 Unisaw, which I, I found, uh, like I said, through the, a friend of a friend of a friend down in South Carolina, and I'm a uh, not ashamed to say I only paid two hundred and fifty dollars for it, <laughs> so I really love it. I added the Unifence later, and the Unifence actually cost more than the saw. You, you got one of the last Unifences, didn't you? I, I I don't know. I think so. I mean, when I bought it, they were uh, like fifty percent off at the place I bought it, and I don't know if you can buy them anymore. You, no, they stopped making the Unifence. They stopped making it. Yeah. So when I saw them on sale, I was like, Yeah, I'm finally going to get one. Which I, re I really like the Unifence a lot. I use it a often. I use it in the low position because I'm, I'm, you know, I cut a lot of thin stuff for uh, bent laminations or, uh, you know, you know, uh, narrow uh, drawer parts or whatever. Um, so 
And I do have one more machine kind of hiding back here, which is not quite up and running yet. But this machine was in fine woodworking back in the black and white days. It was this very machine, actually. Uh, it's a Hitachi super surfacer. And it's actually like a... Um, this is the blade. Uh, so it's like a plane blade, and the plane blade is stationary, and the wood moves through the machine on a conveyor belt. And so you can take up to a 10 inch wide shaving. Wow. And it produces, you know, really thin hand plane shavings, basically. And they were designed, what they're used for in Japan, I think, is uh, they do a lot of timber framing over there. And this is how they finish surface finish, finish the surface of all the timbers. They send them through these big things. So it's how do you hold the piece in? If, if you're, you're clamping it in and then sending it. No, no. It just you just set it down on this conveyor belt, and it just goes through on the conveyor belt, and it just you takes a shave. Wow. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought it would. You know, it wouldn't. It would just stop or slide or. Well, I mean, it's just like a hand plane. Uh, when the blade is sharp, it just takes no effort to, to move it, right? So when that blade is sharp, just just right through. And I've seen examples of, you know, you just have like 15-foot-long shavings that are this wide, you know. They make huge ones uh, for Japan, like really big ones. Um, this one obviously needs a little work. <laughs> but uh, I won't even tell you how much I paid for that one because it would make people cry. I didn't pay anything for it, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> but it probably make me cry in the end because I got to get it working. So it runs, but it's uh, it needs a little bit of work right now. Um, but that's it. Uh, nothing too fancy. Uh, but you don't really need much to no. make furniture. Right? No, you don't. So just my bandsaw is the last thing there, which I got when uh, Mike Pekovich, at the, our art director, bought a big. Mac, a big drill press, and I bought that from him. I actually took out the the riser. It had a riser block in it, but I didn't really like that. So I, I took it out and just made a, a standard 14-inch bandsaw. But like you saw, I, we have an 18-inch bandsaw at work, so when I need to resaw something big, I just take it into work. So it's kind of nice. That, it's nice having that fallback shop at work. <laughs> it's like I can get away with a six inch joiner because I have a 16 inch joiner at work. So uh, it's, it's nice. Uh, but that's my shop. Lights. Oh, that's oh. the last thing. You gotta have lights because that makes all the difference in the world is to have good lighting. So when I, when they, uh, I was very fortunate that the lighting were put in, lights were put in as part of an article of a magazine. So, um, they were done you know, by an electrician. I hung them, the electrician wired them, and uh, it really makes a difference to have real lights. It makes it feel like a shop as opposed to a dungeon or a garage. And uh, it, I can come down here any time of the day or night and work because of how good the lighting is. So it really makes a big difference. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. Sure. In the radio arms,